Diana, Diana, Diana. Emma's audition is notorious. It actually came about through Camilla's audition. We were looking for Camilla's. Nina Golden Roberts today, our casting directors, had brought in Emma to read for Diana. And I remember watching the casting tapes and being completely drawn to this very small part of the screen, sort of literally just down there, and it was Emma. She did the most extraordinary thing in the audition, which really struck me, which was Peter spoke to her about a, a song from Phantom of the Opera and an idea he had. And what I loved about this young woman is that she said, OK, and she sang it unaccompanied live to a room full of people, and you could see the vulnerability, the flush of it coming through her cheeks. And that was the moment when I saw that, I was like, she, she can do this. I remember Ben looking to Suzanne, and he was like, can I do it? Can I do it now? And Suzanne was like, yeah. And then he kind of got down a bit like he was proposing and was like, will you be our Diana? And I got home, my fat mates came home, and I managed to not tell anyone for probably for like 15 seconds. And I was sitting there being like, oh God, I don't know what to do. You know, for us, it was really exciting to see Emma come in. And Gillian, you know, these newbies. And it was just like, oh, we're the six formers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I couldn't tell anyone when I was cast as Margaret Thatcher, although, uh, I think I did. <laughs> Power is nothing without authority. The two characters and the friction that's written is so enjoyable to play. The, the complexity of that relationship, or as I think Philip says in the series, that, you know, two bears can't live in one cave. Um, it's very apt. It was just really fun to have those sort of um, horrible moments with, <laughs> with brilliant Gillian. Thatcher is such a huge figure in our political history and our in this country's history. And so I think it had to have a certain weight to her. But I think there were also aspects which I hadn't maybe anticipated. Julian at times was quite funny with her as well. There's a sort of almost comedic element to it. Oh, so you did hear what I said? Of course I heard what you were saying. I don't need a look at you to show you I'm listening to what you're saying. Well, it might be nice. I don't have the time to be nice. <laughs> Kelsey tells you everything. Well, we talk most days. It's a famous lunch between Camilla Parker Bowles and Diana Spencer, where these two finally meet. And I wanted just to play around a little bit before we actually came to shoot the scene. So unexpectedly, or unexpected to them, I brought Josh in. So even though he's not actually in the scene, I had him sitting in the middle of the table between both Emma and Emerald. And one of the next things was that um, only one of you can put your hand on his. And if you remember the scene, Camilla's already there. So right from the very beginning of the scene, we rehearsed it, Emerald put her hand on Josh's and kept it there throughout the entire scene. And it made it really uncomfortable for Emma. It kind of brought to our attention the fact that regardless of whether Josh was physically there, Charles would, was, it was, we were, even though we weren't explicitly doing it, we were battling it out over him. And it was, just, it was so, it's such an interesting dynamic and that kind of encapsulates the whole thing. Who are you referring to? Camilla. Why would I care about her? Because I care about her! You read those scripts and all you can think is, I just want to effectively tell this story and portray it in the way that Peter has written it. It was just not my job to tell the true story of Prince Charles. That's not what we're doing at all. I like the way Peter takes quite a strong position on certain characters and imagining how they might think or feel because that's the bit that history doesn't account to us. And the amazing thing about Peter's writing is that it offers up this intensely complex human character who is so intricate that it kind of requires you to forget about the pressure and about this like icon thing. Cut your ass, Peter. <laughs> the historian's English is no more than fluid prejudice, I think uh, Mark Twain said, you know, and uh, I'm not entirely persuaded that accuracy is a virtue in itself. This is an interpretive medium and a creative medium. If I felt that at the expense of an inaccuracy, I was somehow violating a, an underlying truth, then I couldn't live with that. So you get into this accuracy versus truth thing. I think this conversation's gone as far as it can. You were the one who insisted on talking. I approach the specific characters from the point of view of never doing an impression. We try not to do impersonations, mainly because the situations are all real, they all happen in history, but the dialogue is made up, and so we have to make it up. You know, you see Erin, who plays Princess Anne, she's always like, jeans and t-shirt, oh, how are you? you know, she's like, rocking around, she's so brilliant, she's like, oh yeah, I'll be there in five minutes. And then this person, this very assured, quite brittle person appears, and you think, okay, I don't know where Erin's gone, but this is great. <laughs> the majority of marriages survive because the majority of people aren't fantasists. They are realists, and accept the imperfect reality of being human. 
I wanted to make Charles Wright, and I'd worked really hard on his voice. Because I felt like, you know, I'd done all this work on a character, but I just wanted to make sure I got the voice right. And I turned up on the first day, and I did the first take, and the director came over to me and said, what on earth are you doing with your voice? I think it was just nerves, and then it was all settled in, and I was, I was totally fine. And with that, she had me work out little systems for her to put on her heavy earring or work with her hands to make her very valid points. The idea is to find a, a shorthand and a vocabulary so that an actor can stimulate some, some truthful action. Her physicality is a big part of what we remember of her. She had a very particular way of walking, for instance. She pumped her arm. The voice and the movements and the way she did those incredibly low, ironic curtsies. She just did it so beautifully and brilliantly, I sort of can't picture anyone else doing it. They are alive, man. You saw them? I did. Jess Hobbs, in particular, me, with this, we wanted to know about the history of mental health and uh, of various members of the family. And we learned a lot about what all these different sort of characters that were sort of probably just, you know, quietly not gotten rid of, but, well, virtually. When I found that out, I thought, well, that's such, an interesting, that's such an interesting thing to write about. And the reason for it is not because I want to expose any family cruelty. It's more to do with the family that was insisting on the birthright and the genetic purity required. I'd personally been very insistent on wanting to work with actors who had some of these uh, disabilities or challenges within their life, and that's the way I wanted to go in casting. And then we had these two extraordinary days of working with these amazing people who I think were incredibly happy to portray things that they experienced but were perhaps no longer part of their lives and it gave them a sense of agency within their own storytelling. Well, coronavirus happened. We only had six days of shooting left, but of course what we had to shoot was an avalanche on a mountain. So I was like, all right, we've got an inciting incident that we weren't able to film. What is it? that we need from that in a story to affect the journey of Charles and Diana and the breakdown of their marriage, and how could we show that in another way. If you see an incident from a kind of universal point of view, it takes away the personal, and by doing this in the editors, it forced us into that absolute specific personal point of view, particularly for Charles, of what that felt like, and how he could never really describe that to someone else. So I think it opened up a, you know, a, a good world of possibilities. Number five, Ibble Dibble, with one Dibble Ibble, calling number four, Ibble Dibble, with two Dibble Ibble. <laughs> It was just like a run-on of scenes where we got to just play games, and it was so much fun. They're playing a game called um, Ibble Dibble in such an awkward situation with Margaret Thatcher attempting to play this ridiculous game. Just the, you know, just the tension that lies even in that idea on the page is so fantastic, and so that was loads of fun. I'm going to miss this cast so much. They were just a really great bunch of human beings. I mean, they loved each other, so it was so much fun to be in a room with them. Now, I'm going to say this now. I couldn't... This was actually in season three, and this is with Olivia. Now, Olivia can be quite sort of naughty and playful. However, from the unit base and the set, there is a big playground, which is for children. And it turns out that Olivia thought it might be a funny idea to go down one of the huge slides as the queen. Stop making spectacles of yourselves. <laughs> we mucked about a bit more. Having loved every second of it, and it'll be one of the most beautiful experiences of my working life. But I am looking forward to playing something different. I want to play something completely opposite. I want to, you know, let rip it. Having lived with her now for two years, I felt tremendous sadness to say goodbye to her because she's been great company. It's funny being an actor, you do feel like you're a guest house and people move in for a bit and then they move out. Sometimes Margaret has popped out, not when I'm on camera, and I go, oh, I'm killed. <laughs> it's wicked and it's cold hearted! It's been a perfect part to my time of life. Is that it? You spend so much time in these people's shoes that actually you kind of do tend to take on their traits. It's just been. It's been a pleasure. It's been a bloody pleasure. I think probably too close to still to sort of know how I feel about it or what it all means. I imagine that will hopefully maybe come later on when you come back properly. I'll definitely miss it. One of the things that attracted me to the role in the first place is that I knew it was going to end and I was going to have two series and then some other lucky fellow will get the chance to, to take him on. And so I've loved it and I'm, I'm happy to say goodbye and pass on the baton, really. I shall bear in mind what you say. Bye. Thanks.